and then okay. we can. Okay, so <laughs> we're not only talking about men and women that are trained as soldiers. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, most of these people were young people that were not trained as soldiers. But the other thing about Jewish resistance, it's not only about young people and soldiers, it's also about this guy over here on the side is going through the, the books of the Strachan Library um, in Vilna. And what is Jewish resistance here is that poets, historians, doctors, nurses actually risk their lives to save books. And a lot of people don't think, well, a student once asked me, people really gave their lives up for books? And I said, yes, for Jews, this is the ultimate in what Judaism is about. So let's see if the next one progresses. How about that? Yes. Is that good? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So also, um, whenever I see, and this is how this all started, whenever I see Jewish resistance uh, portrayed on the screen, I usually see it where people are, are portrayed of escaping from uh, Sobibor. So this is that famous film from Escape from Sobibor about the violence that they had to do to get out. Uh, even though they didn't have really arms, they only had a minimum amount of arms. What is it about this that is compelling? People say, oh, it's an anomaly. It's an anomaly. So they look at Sobibor and they look at the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and they say, it's, a, it's, it's an anomaly. It's not what Jews did all the time. So what I started to do when I started looking at different sites that we're working on is I started to assess where these sites, other sites are. So here, these are the Jewish resistors, the disruptors, I call them, who exhibited a type of courage that most, most people don't even talk about. This is Jewish resistance by doctors and nurses, rabbis, cantors, educators, historians, carpenters, electricians, not necessarily soldiers. And this is from the Warsaw Ghetto. And this scene really tells us about how the Jews resisted the Nazis by trying to create a situation where as many Jews would survive as possible. The story of the archeology span of Jewish resistance includes the materials of the paper brigade, for example, in the Vilna Ghetto. So poets and writers save books by putting them into their pants and into their shirts and risking them being discovered and being killed when they came back to the Vilna Ghetto every day. Rabbis, yeshiva students who are ex ex experienced the terrors of Fort Nine and Kaunas, inspired others by their spiritual res uh, resistance. This is Rabbi Ephraim Oshri, who was the, uh, the rabbi of the Kovno Ghetto but also artists. When people talk to me about resistance, what they don't assess is the ideas of Jewish musicians, Jewish children, actors, singers that performed during the entire Holocaust and their desire to continue to inspire other Jews who are in these, these places, but more importantly, also after the war. Most of the documentation that I'm going to be talking about is after the war. What is it that we know about the Holocaust and where do we know it from? We know it from testimonies. We know it from the material culture. And we know it from documentation that survived because these people were willing to hide the evidence. So Rundabar, for example, wonderful children's opera, which is a great resistance piece against the Nazis, performed the Theresian. These children who performed it in front of Nazis and also um, the Red Cross, they knew that they might not survive the war. But because it was filmed, they knew that their work would survive the war. So most of what I'm talking about, some people have heard of. Most people have heard of the hiding 
of Anne Frank in Amsterdam. What they don't know is Jews hid in the most difficult places on earth in order to survive the Holocaust. This is an example of Jewish resistance at its best. Holocaust tunnels, caves, buried spaces, what we call melinas, these are hiding spaces, bunkers, and hideaways in general. Now, this is a, a camp that we excavated, and what did we find? We find that the people, the Jews that were here in this labor camp outside of Vilna at HKP, survived because they built into their homes false walls. And when the Nazis came to take them away, they couldn't find them. So this is what Jewish resistance is about. Jews hid in a, a cave in Western Ukraine for 344 days without being discovered. Three brothers went to a cave outside of Florence and hid there for the entire winter of 44. These are examples of resistance that people don't always identify because they didn't have guns. But when students ask me of the most effective form of Jewish resistance, they're surprised when I tell them, documentation. The Ringel Bloom archives and the testimonies of survivors from Warsaw is, was the, what was used in the Nuremberg trials and the Eichmann trial after the war to indict the Nazi officers who did the Holocaust. And what's very important about the, the archives is the archives proved to be the only way to document the crimes against humanity. So in this case, I call this the pen often proves mightier than the sword. Jewish resistance by archives, by documentation was very important. The other unlikely Jewish resistance fighters were young women who went out in plain sight and were messengers, kishariot, and they delivered messages from the ghetto into the, uh, the rest of Warsaw and to the rest of the world. And children who every day found time to actually study and made that their resistance movement. And then I like to talk about the escapees from escape tunnels. There were multiple escape tunnels. I've now identified four very important escape tunnels. One was, of course, at Ponar. The other one I'm going to be talking about is Fort Nine. The other one is Novogrodek. And there were tunnels that we used even at Sobibor. At Sobibor, they were trying to get out of the camp with a tunnel that they had dug. And what happened was it started to rain a few days before the, the scheduled date for the rebellion. And what happened was it became impossible to get out through the tunnel. So that's why they rushed the gate. But the people who were involved in the escapes, these are Jewish resistors. They didn't have guns. They used their stealth. They used the ability to actually dig these tunnels, get out through the tunnels, and then tell the world what was happening. So the archaeology of Jewish resistance included for me the documentation with illustrations, with letters, with lists of the dead, and information about the killing fields. So this is a Fort Nine drawing of the burning brigade from Fort Nine by Anatoly Garnick, who got out when the, they all escaped on Christmas, Christmas Day. And his drawings were one of the best ways to illustrate exactly what was going on in the burning brigade, where they brought in Jews to actually destroy all the evidence of all the killing. Well, for example, at Ponar, we were able to actually get a drawing from one of the survivors who went through the tunnel of what it looked like for them to live inside of a burial pit at Ponar and how they built their tunnel. So I, I, I want to go back to my main point. Generation X, Y, and Z have to learn the, the lessons. They have to learn that instead of making 
Jews, the eternal victims of the Holocaust, that they have to say, but the Jews were also one of the great freedom fighters during a genocide. And they did it using these five different ways that I've already identified, using devotion and documentation and dissimulation, using flight or fight, but they used all these different things to maximize the ability of a small minority to actually escape the Holocaust. So for those of you who have never heard about what we're doing, I just wanna give you one short thing. We actually use five or six different types of techniques that are borrowed from the gas and oil exploration companies that are borrowed from uh, gas, um, not only gas and oil, but from universities that have ground penetrating radar. So we do electrical resistivity tomography, which is the MRI for the ground. And we use this other uh, ground penetrating radar, but we also use all these different electromagnetic and we have a variety of drone operated multispectral cameras that actually can identify large sections before we even get to a site. So we've been doing this for about 25 years, but over the years I decided that we had to do much more because this is something we can do quickly it's inexpensive, it's non-destructive, and more than important, it tells each of the stories without having to destroy all the evidence. Now, for those people who are very interesting, non-invasive archeology span is a real thing. It's a way to pinpoint before you even touch the earth or do any, any damage. That's one of the ways I was able to convince the people from the new Warsaw Ghetto Museum that are doing their research to create this new museum inside of Warsaw, that we could help them identify some of the most important sites that are all built on in this new city of Warsaw. You know, Warsaw was destroyed after the war. It was totally destroyed. And it's now been reconstructed meticulously. The only difference is all the sites that we're talking about still exist below the surface. So I'll tell you a few, few different places that we're gonna be visiting, because I think this is the thing that is very exciting. One of the places we're gonna be visiting is the remnants, the last part of the Ring, Ringelblum archives, which was for most people, the single greatest documentation project of the Holocaust. Here were people, 60 historians, that sat down and collected were so afraid that nobody would survive that what they did was at the end of the war, they decided to hide three of three pieces of the archive. Piece one was found in 1946. Piece two was found in 1950. Piece three has never been found. Everybody knows generally where it's located, but everything's been built on. You should know that the place where it was built on is underneath the garden of the Chinese embassy in Warsaw. So getting permission to go and do a non-invasive study and actually recover the last part of this archives is probably the single greatest um, project I've ever been involved in. The second thing we're gonna be working on in Warsaw, we're gonna be working on Mila 18. So anybody who knows who Leon Uris was, Leon Uris wrote this beautiful historical fiction book about Mila 18, the last moments of the leadership bunker of the Warsaw Ghetto. And what's really exciting about it is the bunker is still sitting there. It has not been manipulated or touched. And what we wanna see is what's still inside the bunker. We went there last year, we did a, I'll told, show you the scan, and it looks like there's still materials inside of the Mila 18 site. The Burson and Bauman Jewish Children's Hospital, which is gonna be the, the center of this new Warsaw Ghetto Museum, is a hospital. It was the only hospital. It served children, it served everyone in the ghetto, 
and it had some of the most courageous stories of Jewish doctors and nurses that we've ever heard of. And we want to know what, what more is underneath this hospital. We're looking at the Warsaw concentration camp. Most people know about the Warsaw ghetto. They don't know at the end of the war, they took the last remnants and they put them into a concentration camp in Warsaw. Little has been done to recover that history. So part of what we're gonna be, I'm gonna show you now are the places where we're gonna be going this coming summer. And this is gonna make it for an exciting film. So this, this is what they buried. <laughs> they buried the archives in. Milk cans, in metal canisters. And these are things that are easily found. So the search for the lost Jewish archives of Emanuel Ringelblum is what we're gonna be working on. For those of you who have never seen these, these archives, really they were stuffed inside of these metal canisters thinking that if no Jews survived, at least the archives that told the story of what the Jews did and what the Nazis did would survive. But they found, as I say, two parts of it, one in 46 and the other in 50. And what's very interesting about these is these are easily found by electromagnetics. And that's one of the reasons why I felt so strong about going back with this equipment in order to try and find this last part of the archives. Meal 18. The Meal 18 that you probably know was a bunker that was underneath a, a, a building. The building is gone, the bunker is still there. So this is a wonderful place where people um, people of all different backgrounds go in order to honor the legacy of this Warsaw Ghetto uprising. How the Jews held off for three weeks the Nazis with a ragtag group of young people. And finally on the last day in May when most of the people were caught with a poison gas attack and were killed. Some people got out, and we're going to show you how they got out, because now we know how they got out. But being able to actually see inside of this place and to recover whatever else is inside of the Mila 18 bunker is really what non-invasive archaeology is about. So here's the, the bunker. If, you've, if you haven't been to Warsaw, this is the, the place where everybody's taken. It was used, if most people don't know, there was underneath a big house. It was a smuggler's bunker. And the reason why it was a good smuggler's bunker was because it had a connection to the sewers. And what's very interesting is this is the scan that we did last year. And what did we discover? There's a place in and there's a place out. And there are still materials inside. So for me, this is part of the, the importance of going back to these sites and seeing what can be recovered before it's lost forever. But it's also like the Bearson and Bauman Jewish Children's Hospital, which is not really on everybody's visit list, but it will be when the Ghetto Museum moves there. But most people know the story of Janice Gorzak. So Gorzak was a doctor at the hospital and he protected his orphans in a way that makes his story one of the classic stories of Jewish resistance. Then he marched with his children. He was given the opportunity to turn back. He was a well-known physician in, in Warsaw and he decided to go with his children, ending up at Treblinka. Of course, we all know the story of so Sobibor now, now that uh, the Russians have decided that Sobibor was really, the escape from Sobibor was really engineered by a Russian Jewish soldier. Last year, the um, Russians came out with a blockbuster movie about the story of Sobibor, making the hero one of the great film stars of Russia. But what is very important about the story is that it has so many different pieces of what went on 
to make it possible for those Jews to resist, to escape. And it was really serendipitous that he arrived, but the Jews were able to get out, not through the tunnel that they were hoping to get out through, but really they escaped through the front door. And their escapes and the resistance at 90 different ex concentration camps is really part of the story. Why is this so important? Aren't there movies already about this? The problem is they're not all together. The sites are never told as a cohesive story about Jewish resistance. So people, individuals, young people say to themselves, the Jews did that, but that's an anomaly. The Jews did that, but that's, that's an anomaly. What I'm trying to say is the Jews were doing it all the time. They were resisting at every single place, at every concentration camp, at ghettos, at extermination camps, at labor camps. And if you put them all together, it shows you just how resistant the Jews were to the Nazis. This is just a picture of uh, Sobibor where they found the, the uh, escape tunnel. So I'm gonna go to Lithuania for a moment because Lithuania is one of these underlooked issues and because we're doing so many projects in, in Lithuania. One of the, the best stories of an escape tunnel is actually found in Kaunas. Outside of Kaunas, there are nine forts that were built in the late 19th century and early 20th century to protect Kaunas from enemies, from foreign en enemies. Kaunas was on the way between Russia and, and, and Poland and, and they wanted to have a protection. So they built these nine forts. By World War I, they were totally obsolete. But when the Nazis came in, they found a new purpose for the forts. So we've worked at Fort 4, Fort 7, and Fort 9. Fort 9 is massive, massive. And there's a museum there, and we've been working on the killing fields there to identify exactly where the killing fields are so that nobody builds on them. More importantly, we want to document not only the, the killing, but the escape from Fort Nine. So the escape, <laughs> there's a, a sign inside of the escape tunnel where it's the tunnel says um, 64 Jews, 64, they don't say golden Jews, the golden prisoners, escaped through uh, this door on December 25th, 1943, on Christmas day, they escaped. So we've been following every detail of the, of the escape to find out how they did it. And I think that in itself is one of these stories that is untold, but which was a huge story because at Fort Nine, which is, this is Fort Nine, this is how big it is. This is the killing fields there. We've been able to identify where everyone was killed, where everybody was burnt, and 50,000 people were killed in the field below. 64 Jews were brought in to burn all the evidence. And what they realized was they were never going to get out. So they, they figured out a way to escape. And their escape is one of the most chilling stories of the Holocaust. What do we do? I have to say this because I think this is very important. When we take students to do these excavation projects, the students are doing the work in the field. And this is a generation of generation X, Y, Z, these kids that are a lot of people, and I have to tell you, I've been teaching for 40 years. The amazing thing is, these are the best students in the field that I've ever had. 40 years ago, I had great students in the classroom. They were not so great when they got out to the field. Very tentative. Should I have, do I have to bend down? Do I have to get these, these sneakers dirty? And these kids, they want to see it. They want to touch it. They want to feel it. They want to smell it. They want to be 
a part of the discovery in order to make themselves a part of the narrative. So what we do in this archaeology and the way we're going to present in a film is going to involve students. So people see that this is the next frontier in the Holocaust studies, science. So I'll end with, with more tunnels. For those of you who didn't see, I don't know how many of you did see the uh, Holocaust escape tunnel. There was 100,000 people who were killed. The place is about 10 kilometers outside of uh, Vilna. It's a beautifully manicured place where it's a park and people come there to see the park. They have no idea the horrific camp that it really was. And again, these were burial pits, but they didn't start off as burial pits. The, the Soviets came in, they were there for a year. They, they had a, a secret agreement with the Nazis that they were gonna take Lithuania and the Nazis would take the rest of the areas. And what they did was the Soviets set up pits for gasoline because they were gonna build a, a, a new uh, airport. And so what they did was the Nazis took, when they came in and kicked the Soviets out, they took these pits and made them into killing pits. Ponar was the Auschwitz of Lithuania. And the massacres were, I think, in many ways, worse than Auschwitz. Because at Auschwitz, somebody pushed a button. It was anonymous. At Ponar, the killer knew the victim, the perpetrator, and the, the Jew knew each other. They could see each other. And there was a Holocaust by bullets where they shot each individual person into these pits, covered them with lime, shot more. And this went on for over a year. This is really one of the, the background pieces for understanding the Holocaust escape tunnel. So what happened? 100,000 people were killed. Nazis are losing the war in 1944. And they decided they had to get rid of all the evidence. But who's going to get rid of all the evidence? They brought in 80 Jews. They brought them from all around and from close. And they put them into this burial pit. And what did they do there? The Nazis basically put them into this pit six and they made them get up every day and go out, dig up the bodies and burn them. So there would be nothing but ash. So no tribunal could ever say that the Nazis did any of this. How did we document all this? First of all, we used aerial photos that are in our own uh, naval archives. But second, we went out into the field and located where these places are. So this is our scientific map. It tells you exactly what we did. And in the midst of this, whenever I bring this equipment to uh, countries, one of the things I always do is I offer it for free to a variety of different uh, museums, universities, uh, institutions in the country who want to do archaeological projects with non-invasive geoscience techniques. So what we did was we asked the Vilna Gaon Jewish State Museum, what is the most important site that you would like us to do for you? Well, we'd like to find out if there's, they said, we'd like to find out if there's any more burial pits at Ponar. I said, oh, that's a good, that's a good project. And then they told us, and then there's a story. We don't know if it's true, but there's a story that the Jews who were in the burial pit, number six, they built a hand dug tunnel that was a hundred feet long from the pit out beyond the barbed wire and got out. 
We don't know if it's true, but there are people who have given testimonies that they were the people that actually did this. Do you think we can find some physical evidence? What is very, very compelling about the story of the Holocaust escape tunnel is the courage of these people. These are people that dug all day and burned sometimes their own compatriots from Vilna that they knew. They found family members. And these same people would come back to the pit at night, shackled, and they would go into a tunnel and continue to dig all night long. To me, when people ask me the level of Jewish resistance, and I point to something like Ponar, to me, those people represent the highest qualities of heroic and courageous kind of resistance. So just to show you what Ponar looks like, and there's the students in the back, they're, they're laying the lines to, so we can collect data to know where the uh, additional um, burial pits are. The train is still running. It's still a park. And but for the fact that we had this kind of equipment, we never would have been able to do this work. So for those of you who didn't see it, this is me sitting on the edge of a burial pit. This is a multi-spectral camera, though the image looks like it has different colors of the rainbow to tell us where there's hot spots, where digging was done, where digging wasn't done. But more importantly, on the first and second day of the work that we did, we were able to locate 15 feet below the pits, 15 feet below the area where the entire camp was located, pieces of the tunnel. And I think that there's very little that I can say that gives us one a sense of being able to not only show and authenticate stories that are so heroic of the Holocaust, but also to be able to have that material be a part of the exhibits, the story of Ponar. Not just the killing, but the people who got out. So we're lucky, we had a lot of uh, testimonies. Uh, these people gave these testimonies after the war and we were able to work with, uh, with these testimonies and, and know exactly what they did. And they left, by the way, on the last night of Passover, 1944. And the amazing thing is the darkest night, when these people got to the partisans, they left and they, searched out partisan groups to be able to fight the Nazis. They arrived in the same clothes they had been wearing, burning the bodies. And people looked at them and they said, where are you coming from? They said, Ponar. And they said, nobody gets out of Ponar. I don't believe you. And what's even worse, when they came home and they started their new families, Many of them went to Israel. Their children didn't believe them. Their grandchildren could hardly believe that these people did these heroic acts. But I have to say the importance of do, doing this non-invasive work, because the non-invasive work was hailed by the New York Times as one of the top science stories of 2016. It was across the world, from Africa to Asia, South America, North America. People all over the world were writing about an escape tunnel that was dug by hand by Holocaust survivors. And more importantly, what the film does, and this is what I think this new film that Paul is working on with us on Jewish resistance, is to meet with the families, to give them a sense of closure, to tell them what their parents did, what their grandparents did. And if there is any consolation to this whole thing, it is a very simple thing that maybe if people know 
that perpetrators of genocide can never get away with genocide, maybe it will stop genocide. Maybe it will inhibit genocide. But the people that I did this for were these people. For these survivors, these are the children and the grandchildren that we located in Israel. There was not a moment that I didn't feel in awe of being able to tell them what their parents, what their grandparents really did during the Holocaust. And finally, one of the last <laughs> projects that we're gonna be working on, we're gonna be doing a four country um, uh, Jewish resistance project. It's gonna include um, Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, and Latvia. One of the things that we, we really wanna do is to document. Everybody knows this movie Defiance. And by the way, again, a lot of people say, well, it's, is it really true? The Bielski brothers in Belarus were really an amazing part, not only because they had guns, but because they established Jewish communities in the forest. And what we want to be able to do is to look at the evidence of these villages that they established in the forest as a sign of Jewish resistance. And then for those people who don't know, Novogorodik. Novogorodik is really one of the largest tunnels that's ever been discovered. There's speculation that it was as far, as long as 750 feet. Some people say it's 600 feet. The tunnel was discovered coming out of the courthouse in the ghetto of Novogorodik. And what's more important than that is that those people, every single one of them got out through the, the, the tunnel. And more importantly, <laughs> the Jews, before they would open the tunnel to allow people to go out, they took a vote. And the Jews voted to escape, even though they knew the risks involved. But the other risk was if they stayed. So part of this whole story of resistance is what was the risk? What was the courage? How heroic it was and how unusual it is not just to talk about the physical, but the types of documentation, the types of dissimulation, the hiding the Jews had to do, the devotion of Jews in captivity. So I'm sorry that I, I couldn't do this from the very beginning. I hope you're still with me. And I will take questions, but more important than the questions, if you miss anything, I have three very good books that I can recommend. One is The Archaeology of the Holocaust. It came out last year. Digging Through History has everything from the ancient period all the way through to the Holocaust and Digging Through the Bible, which is about biblical history. Thank you very much. Thank you. Will you unshare the screen and we'll take a few questions? Okay. Um, I'll start Thank with a few with a question or two while, while you unshare the screen. The okay. first is, um, I think people ask this a lot, which is you're going to Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, and Latvia. You've already done projects in Poland and Lithuania. I don't know about Belarus and Latvia. Yeah. Um, how much support do you get or non-support do you get from the local governments in those three, uh, four countries? Well, first I have to, I have to say that um, we have permits already. We have permits to do this. These are government permits. We work with local archeologists. We work with local museums. Part of the, the entire project is that we needed to find partners that were willing and interested to do this. So in Poland, for example, we have the new museum of the Warsaw Ghetto. And I have to thank them because they were the first to actually say, we need you. Because these are projects in the old Warsaw Ghetto that by the way, is totally built upon. One can never see really what was there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take iconic places and try to restore them. We have to have permits in Latvia. We have to, and so we're working, for example, in Latvia with the uh, Museum of uh, 
Jewish civilization in, in Latvia. We're working in, in Lithuania with the Fort Nine Museum. And in Belarus, we're working with the permitting committees to allow us to go to see these things. All of this is dependent upon two things. Number one, COVID. <laughs> COVID. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, we will be allowed to go in next year, even with a skeleton crew. Remember, we're not looking to do this with uh, 100 people. We usually come in with about 10 people and we're able to do this, to document it. But more importantly, whether we can find the funding to do this. I, th I feel like this is, this is a moment in history. I have a science group that now has done 22 projects in Lithuania and Poland and in Rhodes, Greece on the Holocaust. We have the expertise. We have willing governments that are still interested in allowing us to do this. I can't say that this is gonna be the same thing in the future. So is 2021 a very important date? Yes, 2021 is a very important date. And we need two things. We need to be able to get into the country. And the second thing is we need to be able to finance the, um, the project. Um, sorry, if you don't mind, unshare the screen. That way we can have you okay. as the, okay. the main thing. Okay. I think there's just a button for unsharing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get out of the... There you go. So um, do any of the countries give you money? Have you received any financial support from Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Latvia? Yes, and I, I have to say, there's two things that I do want to say about money. I will not accept money from the government of Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, or Latvia. Part of this problem is, and I'm, I hope everybody understands the slippery slope that you get on. When you take money from a country, they have an expectation that what the results will be, will be to their advantage. I can't promise that. I can't promise that. The only thing I can promise them is that we'll do a successful job of documenting what, what we've been asked to do. The other thing is, I, I, I have to say, what, what is, what is the, the, one of the big funders that we have is we've been, we've been getting funding from a group called Targum Shlishi, which is an important um, Holocaust era and other uh, projects uh, foundation in Florida. We have received money from the U.S. government in the form of the U.S. Embassy in each one of these countries that supports our work. As U.S. citizens, we, they support our work and they want us, by the way, they want us to be able to make friends in places like Belarus, make friends with the scientists in Latvia, make friends with people in Lithuania and Poland so that these collaborations will continue in the future. And there's other, other groups. So, you know, I have to say that um, individual donors have paid for most of this. And there's no strings attached, meaning the, the individual donor doesn't say, I want the result to be X. But what we try to do is we try to make sure that we do the best science possible. So people 30 years from now with better equipment with better ideas, we'll go back to these sites and say, you know, we can find out more about what happened here. And that's, that's really the, the, the most important part. So we're not only trying to, to change the, the, the paradigm for Jews as victims with this film and this project. It's really also about changing the paradigm of how people do Holocaust archeology span because one of the things that I make clear to my students is that we do not want to victimize the victims a second time. We don't want to dig up people. This is the way it was done earlier. Now, what we're able to do is we can identify where the, the graves are, where the people are, but where the structures are of the Holocaust, 
where the evidence is that can be taken to show what happened here. So part of this is we are looking for donors. We are looking for foundations. But part of it really is that we're hoping that we can get out to the field and do these sites as soon as possible. I will share with everybody in the group about if you want to support this or if you know of people who you think may want to support this or foundations, I will share contact information and so on with, you know, with regard to Paula so you can get involved to the extent you want to get involved or if you're from a different synagogue um, other than, you know, and you want to bring um, Richard or Paula to your synagogue or to your community to talk about it, I think that would be great as well. Um, Sai Zilberstein asked, how are you making the world aware of this? And I assume it's by doing programs like this. Um, you've been very successful at the, with regard to PBS and the Nova series on the Ponar um, uh, documentary. So that probably got information out, but it's probably one person at a time and uh, referrals and you never know. You meet the right person who's interested and has funds or the right foundation and that, that helps you underwrite your, your research and your, your I, I want to say I want to say one word about publicizing these things. I write books. I write articles. Lots of people write books. Lots of people write uh, articles. 20 million people saw the Holocaust escape tunnel worldwide. 20 million people. I made another film called The Good Nazi about this site at the HKP in Vilna, where one Nazi major saved the largest contingent of Vilna's Jews. Nobody knows the story. Part of this really is that if we are worried about our youth and our country to understand the significance of the Holocaust. We cannot base it solely on victimhood. We have to base it on the idea that Jews helped themselves, they resisted, and that narrative is something that I think will help Jews, but it will also help their neighbors to understand why the story is important. I want to add that one of our participants, say Helen Rasner, her uh, father um, survived um, by hiding in the HKP um, building um, in Vilna, in Vilnius. Just so she's going to be in touch with Paula about her story. So the more we get the stories out, the better. Just a few questions about what you talked about. We were our group went to Vilna. I met you in downtown Vilnius, and my parents and my daughter and I had a great tour. You know, if you can ever get a tour with Richard Freund or Vilnius, you should take it. Trust me. Great stories, and it was a great time. And I appreciate you taking time after davening on Shabbat morning in the show. But what you did, what you didn't say was where you went that was so unique. Is we discovered the great synagogue of Vilna that was hiding in plain sight underneath an elementary school in downtown Vilnius. And now, after excavating for five years, the municipality and the country has given this site that was one of the great holy sites for all European Jewry. The great synagogue of Vilna, they've given it back to the Jewish community and it's gonna become a museum. And I, I can't stress, a lot of people talk about how the Holocaust is important unless we also understand what was lost. So things like these synagogues, we discovered in a parking lot, in a parking lot in Northern Lithuania, a synagogue was still there. We discovered in a lagoon an entire Jewish village that was inundated after by a dam that the Soviets built. So part of this is not just to, to look at archives. Archives are important. It's taking those students out to the field to do this kind of original work before it's impossible to do it. Uh, people have asked, you know, we went, I went to, we, we organized a trip for CSP to go to Poland and I said, we're going to go to Lithuania because that's where my family's from, 100% Lithuanian. So we tagged it in and we went there first and people say, well, was it worth going? And the answer is yes. It's, I mean, I, I've tracked my family back to 1740 in a little village um, in Northern uh, Lithuania. So um, I urge you all, if your family's from if you know where your family's from, whether it's Lithuania or Poland or Belarus or Russia, you need to go. Or Latvia, Latvia. Or Latvia, Latvia, you know, uh, many places, Estonia, I don't know. Yeah. You really have to go, go back and see, experience and get a little taste of where you come from. Because you were there for hundreds of, you probably in your recent family history, that's the longest place where you were from. 
you know, <laughs> I mean, if you're Sephardi, fine, you, you have an out, you can go to Morocco and you can go, uh, you can go to um, uh, Spain, you can go other places to look at. But if you're an Ashkenazi, these places are very important. And the stuff, the work that, that Richard Freund is doing is amazing. I, I did tell the group how I, I found you in the newspaper, called you, right. and you met us, but you got our group into the archaeological right. site. And then I, I think about a week after we were there, they made a major discovery right. in the archaeological just, they, they found something. You know, I was hoping they'd find it while we were standing there, but they didn't. You know, uh, we found the bima, the bima right. of, the, of, of the synagogue, which was, by the way, was underneath the principal's office in the uh, elementary school. And the principal comes in, she looks at her office because we just dug right through her office and she says, how did you know to dig there? I said, that's what this is all about. When we do an MRI, then we can actually see that it's there. But she was so confused and apologetic. And I, I, I just want to say one thing about going on these, these types of excursions, going out to do these things should be something that you feel strongly about. Someone, a couple of people asked me, why do I do this? Well, first of all, I've been doing it for 40 years, but I was doing ancient sites until in 2014, an archeologist in Israel came to me and said, you know, Richard, I'd like to do a project with you. And he was a Byzantine archeologist and I was doing Roman period uh, projects. And I said, John, what do you want to do? He says, I want to excavate the great synagogue of Vilna. And I looked at him and I said, John, you're a Byzantine specialist. I'm a Roman specialist. What are, what are we doing going to Vilna? He says, my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents came from Vilna. And I know that your parents and your great-grandparents all came from Vilna. So part of this, I have to say, gives me great personal satisfaction that I, I can go to a place where I, my family was from and restore part of the history that's gone. 90% of Lit Lithuanian Jews were wiped out during the Holocaust. All that's left are the remains of buildings, cemeteries. But knowing about it and doing something about it are two different things. The second thing is, the other thing that I'm trying to do is I am trying to get students out to the field. Because when I get students out to the field, they come back to the university motivated to learn more. They want to learn more. And I have to tell you, just, just so I, I, I don't miss this, most of my students who have gone with me are not Jewish. And then, by the way, when we work in Lithuania, we work with Lithuanian students. The reason is because it is their history that we're trying to recover. Not only our history, it's their history. And I'll tell you one short story. We're excavating at the Great Synagogue. And we're working in the bathhouse. And we found these uh, two or three mikvaot, these ritual... Uh, bathing uh, pools that are found inside the, uh, uh, the bathhouse next to the great synagogue. So it was a big discovery. And what happens is the news comes. They were going to put it on the big news channel about the discovery of these mikvot. So I turned, you know, the, so they, they looked at me and they said, do you want to talk about the, the mikvah and I'll translate for you? I said, oh, no, mantas. Montes was my colleague, my archaeological, Lithuanian archaeological uh, uh, colleague. I said, no, Montes, you're going to go on the news tonight, and you're going to talk about the mikvah. And I'll tell you, sitting, watching Montes, a Lithuanian who is 28 years old and an archaeology PhD, talking about the mikvah ot of the great synagogue, There is no, there is no greater satisfaction than to know that you, you have now entered an area where they are recovering their own history and knowing how important it is. And they know what was lost and knowing what was lost. So 
So if you are interested and you are going to be in, in Europe in, in, in June, July, when we're going to be working there, write me a note. Tell me. I'll tell you if we're going to be there. And not that I'm going to promise you you're going to be in the film. And not that I'm going to promise you you're going to get to excavate. But you'll be able to at least photograph yourself there and feel like you are a part of history. Well, I think we're going to end there. So many more questions, though. I didn't know about this Warsaw Museum. I think I'd heard about it. When we were in Warsaw, it is a hard place to envision Jewish history because there's not much there. So you're going to bring it back for us. So I appreciate that. Um, I will say that if people want to go to Lithuania, I, I, I didn't think I'd ever want to go back. But, you know, there, I didn't spend enough time there. We only spent, I went there a few days early. Then we spent about two days there with the group. I think we could spend a whole week just in Lithuania. Um, and looking at some of the cool and interesting things. If you want to go to Lithuania and we can get a group, I will make it happen. So you just have to email me. We're not going to go tomorrow, but um, I know where to stay and I know places I really want to go to. And then we'll, we'll hook up with, uh, with the professor at some of the sites and we'll get an insider's perspective. Um, it was really cool. I have some video of us with, um, at the site with our group for example, in, in the Great Synagogue. So that was number one. Number two, I wanted to thank Paula Absol for her work for, with PBS, with NOVA. If you love NOVA, you're talking to a very important person we have on here. Um, and so Paula, thank you. And um, we, we hope you're successful in this project. We know you will be successful. And I think everybody on this group, we still have 140, 150 people here. Um, people, I know everyone's committed to this type of project. So um, I think... We will see what people can do. Maybe we can help in some way and, and lead you to people who would support this type of program. And the, the third thing is, um, hopefully, Paula, you can send me links to the Ponar um, documentary and maybe to the, the, the uh, Good Nazi one because people really need to see these two. To, <laughs> they will not believe them. First of all, they, they will learn incredible stuff, but then they will see the quality of these two productions. They're amazing. And then they'll see what the quality will be of this, of this next production that you're working on. So if you could send me that, I will share it with the group. And um, I'm glad we, we worked out the technology. You look great there. Uh, <laughs> and this is, this is one of these things is you have to persevere. You have to persevere. So I'm glad that we <laughs> persevered and I'm glad that it worked out. And thank you for your patience. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for uh, sticking through it. Have a good one. Hope you uh, learned a lot today. It, it, it was a great way to commemorate uh, the week of Kristallnacht and, uh, and uh, the great work that Paul is doing and that uh, Professor Freund is doing. And um, it's amazing to have people like Helen Rasner, whose father was uh, in that HKP location. And um, that's how he survived. Lithuania is a great place to go visit. It's a challenging place to go visit. And there's a lot of interesting things. And if you, as I said, if you want to go, you tell me, but maybe we'll do something. If we have, if we have so many Litvaks on, you tell me, and then we'll, we'll do some more projects about the Jews of Lithuania. Have a good one. Have a good one, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Professor.